In this lesson, we're going to revisit the idea of coordinate systems. So we've already seen an idea of coordinate systems, and so we'll, we'll be rebringing in some of those, those uh, thoughts. But first, we're going to start with theorem 8. So if we have a basis for a vector space, so remember the basis is linearly independent and it spans, the span of it is equal to the vector space. Then for every x in v, there is a unique set of scalars where that you can build that vector from your basis vectors. Okay. The key point about this is unique, that no matter what vector you pick, if you have a basis, there is one and only one way of building it from your basis vectors. And we're going to look at a proof of this. There's going to be an outline of a proof. And it's going to contain some uh, one idea in here of something that you'll see quite frequently in proving mathematical theorems. Okay, so we start off by saying, okay, we have our basis and we have a vector. So because we have the basis, the definition of a basis that is that it spans the span of the vectors in that basis is everything in there. So no matter what we take from our vector space, no matter what our x is, we can create an equation with, we can find the scalars that that's equal to. Okay. So that's because it spans the vector space. But now what we have to do is show that it's unique. And why is it unique? So if it's not unique, then it means we can find another set of scalars, that the scalars are different, but it also works. So let's say that it's not unique we can find another set of scalars. So we have the C's that work and we also have the D's that work. Well, what we're gonna do is we are going to subtract one from the other. So we have these two equations and we are just going to subtract one equation from the other. What do we get? Well, the left-hand side, we get X minus X. On the right-hand side, we get the equation with the D's minus the equation with the C's. Gather everything up together we get that zero equals something times B1 plus so on, plus something times BN. Now the key here is that the C's and the D's, we said that they are different. Well, that means that there's something in here that's not zero. Some of the scalars in here are not zero. So we have some coefficients in that line that are non-zero. That means we have a non-trivial solution for zero equals a linear combination of our basis vectors. But we were we started out by saying that, that B is a basis. That means they're linearly independent. That means the only solution is the trivial solution. So that's a contradiction. So in other words, there can only be one solution. As soon as there's a second solution, we can find, we can show that our basis or the vectors we claim to our basis are not linearly independent. So this, this is bringing a couple of ideas of things that you'll see quite often in mathematics. One is the proof by contradiction. So I said, okay, well, let's assume that it's wrong and show it's impossible. Why is it impossible? Because it violated one of our initial assumptions. That's a proof by contradiction. That's a very common thing that you see in mathematics. A second idea of something that you see is when you have a couple of things you'll add them or subtract them together and see what happens. It'll often show that you get something else brand new that violates some of your constraints. Okay, so there's a couple of ide mathematical ideas in this little proof that shows that when you have a basis that you can build any scalar out of it and it's unique in the way that you do it. There is only one way of doing it. That should align with the ideas that we've already talked about, about linear independence. So here's a definition. Now we're talking about coordinates here. We have already seen an example of coordinates in an earlier lesson. So if we have, but now we're going to put it in terms of a basis. So if we have a basis for our vector space and some other vector in there, we say that the coordinates of that vector relative to that basis are those scalars 
that that form the linear combination that builds that vector. And we just saw from the previous theorem that it's unique. There is only one way of doing it. So we take those scalars out of there and we say that the coordinate vector of x relative to that basis is this. Now, if you change your basis, you're going to get different coordinate vectors. But this tells me how to how to get to that vector from my basis using the elements of my basis. Now that that this also gives us a mapping. So we have our point x, which is a vector. Well, this changes it into a different vector. That coordinate system is itself a vector. We say that this mapping is the coordinate mapping determined by our basis B. So, for instance, we have seen this example. So we have seen that if we have this basis, this was from our earlier lesson, we have this coordinate system. So what we have here is that we started with the vector 2, 3. We have a linear transformation. This basis gives us a linear transformation that takes the vector v and turns it into the vector 1, 2. A basis gives us a linear transformation from, in this case, R2 onto R2. So it's transferring, it's changing every vector in R2, making a linear transformation. So we have a couple of things going on here, a couple of different layers. We have the idea of the basis and getting the coordinates of a basis. But once we have that basis, that is giving us the, an idea of a linear transformation. So it's telling us how to change every vector into some other vector. Theorem nine says that if we have a basis for a vector space, then this coordinate mapping that we just talked about, changing a vector into its coordinate uh, coordinate vector relative to that basis is a one-to-one -one linear transformation from our vector space onto our n. Okay. Now, now for proof of this, we're not going to go into the proof, but basically remember what a linear transformation was. A linear transformation just had a couple of these properties. It preserved addition and it preserved scalar multiplication. So to show that, to prove this, you have to show those two things. There is additional things here. You have to show it's one-to-one -one and it's onto. Remember what one-to-one -one is? It means that if you start from two different vectors, you, you end up with two different vectors. So there's exercises in the book that, that get you to do that. The other thing is onto. Remember what onto means? It means that you can get any element of Rn by starting somewhere in V. So this, this theorem tells us that this mapping that is induced by the, the basis that you choose is actually a special type of mapping. And we'll get into that in a couple of minutes. Okay, so we have, um, I've, I've just said that this is a linear transformation. So remember that from what we saw before, that if you have a linear transformation, there is a matrix that associated with that linear transformation. So the question is, what is this matrix? And when you're talking about a basis and the change of coordinates through a basis, it's very simple. That base, that matrix is just a matrix made up of your basis elements. So if we have a basis, 
and we have some point in there, we can get our coordinates for that point relative to that basis. So define the matrix PB, where each of the columns are just all of your matrix or all of your basis elements. Now, think about what this is. This is equivalent to this equation. X equals PB times X of B. What is that? Take a look at what X of B is. Take a look at what your basis elements are. Multiply them out. And you're going to see you end up with exactly that equation. Okay. So this coordinate, this matrix made up of the columns of your basis is a, it's called a change of coordinates matrix. What it's doing is it's taking your coordinates relative to your basis and putting it back into the coordinates of your standard matrix. So it is taking coordinates relative to a basis and putting it, transforming it back into the coordinates relative to your standard matrix or your standard basis. And that's called a change of coordinates matrix. So that is a linear transformation. But note that this is invertible. Why is it invertible? Well, for this, skip back to some of the things we thought, talked about earlier. Your columns in your basis matrix are linearly independent. So that means it's invertible. Using some of the lessons from earlier lessons. So it's invertible. Then we have PB inverse. And we can get that. We had that x is equal to pb times the coordinates of x relative to your basis. It's just taking the inverse. So what does this mean? This means that that matrix pb inverse is the matrix associated with that linear transformation that we talked about earlier. That takes your original coordinates and turns them into the new coordinates. So if you want to get the coordinates of a basis or the coordinates of a point relative to a basis, what do you do? You build this matrix out of your basis elements, find the inverse, and that is the matrix that turns your XY coordinates or your standard matrix coordinates into the coordinates relative to that new basis. Theorem 9 that we saw just a minute ago said that this was a one-to-one -one and onto transformation. And I said that there's a special, that transformations like this are kind of special. We call that an isomorphism. So if you have a linear transformation that is one-to-one -one and onto, it is called an isomorphism. What it means is that these two things are essentially the same thing, maybe with just different names to them. If you do a calculation on your first, on your V, and then you do the exact same calculation on things in W, you get the same exact thing. So in a sense, you have two entities that are the exact same, but just have different names or different orders to them. So an isomorphism in mathematics is an important concept because we, we often ask questions about how many types of things do we have? An isomorphism really says that two things are the exact same and you, you don't have to count them again. So it's an, an isomorphism is an important concept in math. We aren't gonna do too much about isomorphisms here, but it's just introducing this idea of identifying when things are essentially the same mathematically, even though they may look very different. And that's the idea of coordinate systems. Okay, so just in summary, it takes a little bit to get your head around some, around some of these ideas of coordinate systems.
So a little bit of practice with some of the examples from the book would be a, a good idea for this. The coordinate system is just a way of specifying a vector given a certain basis. We're always used to specifying vectors with the standard basis. But mathematically, there is no reason to use that basis. We can use any basis. Coordinate systems, when we think about coordinate systems, it's telling us how to change the, the way to specify a vector from one basis to another. Doing that gives us a linear transformation. Once we have that linear transformation, then we, we can figure out very easily what our matrix is for that linear transformation. It's the columns, the columns of the matrix are the basis elements and then take the inverse of it. And that's the transformation from your standard matrix, standard basis to a representation in the new basis. This, as I said, this is a concept that can take a little bit while to, to grasp. Doing some examples on this would be a very good idea.